Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at the Dental Assistant Council meeting. My name is Jerry Fowler, and I'm chair of the Dental Assistant Council. Today is Thursday, May 12th, 2022. This Dental Assistant Council meeting is being held in person at the Sheridan Garden Grove Hotel in beautiful Garden Grove, California. So I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask board staff to call the roll. Good morning, my name is Marilla Turan. I would now call the roll. Epps Robbins. Present. Fowler. Present. Miyasaki. Present. Olagi. Olagi, present. Pacheco. Pacheco, present. Pliss. Present. Reed Espinoza. Present. A quorum has been established. Thank you. We'd now like to move on to agenda item two, introduction of new council members. The council had vacancies on two RDAs employed clinically in a private dental practice, a public safety net, or dental health care clinic. At the February 2022 board meeting, two RDAs were appointed to fill these vacancies, and I have the privilege of introducing them to you. Our first appointee is Deandra Epps Robbins, who has had uh, 25 years experience working as an RDA. She is a graduate of San Diego Mesa College, receiving her associate degree and her RDA in 1997. She works clinically for San Isidro Health King Chavez Clinic in San Diego, California, working with special needs patients as neurosurgery RDA. Deandra is also a part-time faculty member for PDE, Professional Dental Enterprise College in San Diego, teaching in their Registered Dental Assisting Educational Program. Our second appointee is Candace Ray Pliss. Candace has seven years experience working as an RDA. She graduated from Pasadena City College Dental Program, receiving a Clinical Excellence Award and her RDA in 2015. Candace serves as an advisory board member for the Pasadena City College Dental Program. She's employed as a lead registered dental assistant at 360 Dentistry in New Hall, California. Please help me welcome and congratulate Ms. Deandra Epps Robbins and Ms. Candace Ray Pliss to the Dental Board of California Dental Assisting Council. Thank you. We'll now move on to agenda item three, public comment on items not on the agenda. Are there any public comments on items that are not on the agenda? Well, definitely. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me better now? I'll try to skip closer. So I'm seeing no public comments. So uh, we're, thank you. And we're going to move on to agenda item four then. Discussion and possible action on the January 28, 20, 2022 meeting minutes. Is there any council member discussion? No, I'm not seeing any cards turned up or hands. Okay, is there a motion and a second to approve the minutes? Miyasaki, motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Reed Espinoza, second. Thank you. The motion is to approve the minutes as is. Uh, with Miyasaki um, uh, uh, motioning, and the second is from Reed Espinoza. Okay, are there any public comments on the minutes? No? 
Not seeing any um, public comments. Board staff, will you please call the roll and record the votes for this agenda item. This is Morella Turan. The motion is to approve the January 28, 2022 meeting minutes as is. Epps Robbins. Fowler. Aye. Miyasaki. Miyasaki, aye. Olagi. Olagi, yes. Pacheco. Pacheco, aye. Pliss. Pliss, yes. Reed Espinoza. Reed Espinoza, aye. The motion passed. Thank you. So we'll now move on to agenda item five, update on dental assisting examination statistics. I'm going to ask Ms. Tina Valerie, Chief of Administration and Licensing, to present this agenda item. Good morning, I'm Tina Valerie. I'm the Chief of Administration and Licensing for the board. And I will be presenting agenda item five, update on dental assisting examination statistics. This agenda item begins on page 10 of your meeting materials and provides the examination statistics for the RDA combined general written and law and ethics exam, the RDA EF written clinical and practical exams, the orthodontic assistant permit written and the dental sedation assistant permit written. The statistics are for fiscal year 2021 and 2022 through March 31st of 2022, along with the prior two fiscal years. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any council member comments? I'm not seeing any council member comments. Are there any public comments on this agenda item? No. No public comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on now to agenda item number six. Update on dental assisting licensing statistics. I'm also going to ask Ms. Tina Valerie to continue with this agenda item. Good morning again. <laughs> this agenda item begins on page 12 of your meeting materials and continues through page 22. This memo provides an overview of the licensing statistics for the dental assisting unit. The tables and charts within this memo indicate the number of applications received, approved, issued, canceled, withdrawn, and denied. Also included are the number of active, inactive, delinquent, and canceled licenses, along with the current and active registered dental assistant licensees by county and population. All of this data is for fiscal year 21-22 through March 31st of 2022 and the prior two to three fiscal years. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any council member comments? Not seeing any council member comments. Are there any public comments on this agenda item? No? Okay, um, thank you. We'll now move on to agenda item seven, update on dental assisting educational program and course applications and reevaluations. Once again, I'm gonna ask Ms. Tina Valerie to continue with this agenda item. Thank you. 
This memo begins on page 23 of your meeting materials and provides an overview of the new dental assisting program and course applications submitted to the board and the status of these applications. Also included is an overview of the reevaluations being conducted. Currently, we are conducting reevaluations for RDA and RDA EF programs along with standalone courses. Um, we have provided the status of each of the reevaluations within the memo as well, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any board member comments? Not seeing any board member comments. Are there any comments, uh, public comments on this agenda item? Okay. Um, thank you. We'll now move on to agenda item eight, discussion and possible action regarding recommendations of council working group on RDAF administration of local anesthesia and nitrous oxide. I'm going to ask Ms. T uh, Tina Valerie to present the background information on this agenda item and then I will continue with this. Thank you. At the November 2018 council meeting, a presentation was given by Joan Greenfield regarding a proposal to add the administration of local anesthesia and nitrous oxide to the scope of practice of RDA EFs, licensed on or after January 1st, 2010. At the November 2021 meeting, the council established a two member working group, which includes Chair Fowler and Vice Chair Reed Espinoza. They were asked to discuss and study the need for expanding the RDAEF scope of practice and to reevaluate whether a survey of dentists and RDAEFs to assess their opinions on adding the administration of local anesthesia and nitrous oxide to the RDAEF scope of practice needed to be performed. The council asked the working group to return with a list of the specific issues to be studied and the survey questions. At the January 2022 meeting, the working group presented their proposed survey questions to the council. After a robust discussion, the council delegated authority to the two member working group to continue working with OPES to finalize the surveys and bring them back to a future meeting. The working group has reviewed OPES's recommendations to the surveys and are bringing them back today for your consideration and feedback. We are asking the council to review the survey distribution proposal and draft survey questions prepared by the working group to determine if any revisions are needed and to delegate authority to the working group to work with OPES to finalize the surveys and distribute to stakeholders. And with that, I will turn it over to Chair Fowler. Thank you. So the working group of Tracy Reed Espinosa and myself, uh, we worked with OPES and we came up with the questions that you have in your meeting handouts there. I believe the questions are both qualitative and quantitative data is being assessed. Um, on these uh, assessments. And you can see there is one that is marked for the RDA EF. It uh, has a bold, uh, or excuse me, yellow header. And then following that one is one with a blue header, which is for the supervising dentist. Um, I don't know if I need to actually go through question by question. If, has everyone reviewed uh, the questions, right? So I think what I'd like to do is jump ahead and get right into it. Let's start discussing how you feel about the questions that we're presenting. So are there any board member comments regarding the proposed survey questions? I just had one question about <clears throat> the questions that ask about the average amount of time. Um, is there, should, should that be limited to within the last year or do you, um, I mean, I think it's, great both ways, but I just wanted to find out from the rest of the council members that they thought 
uh, when discussing the average, that that should be like within the last, within your scope of practice, like the, how you've been working or within the last year, or should we just, just keep it at the average time that you've waited for local anesthesia? I mean, I'm fine with it either way. I just want to just th throw that out there. At this point, I think it's good to keep it general. Um, we, uh, if they've been supervising, um, we don't know how long they've been in practice supervising with them. It could be an associate dentist that is filling this out, possibly. So I think we should keep it general. I think, and also OPE, OPES's recommendations were to, we'll start off with these surveys and see what kind of data results we get first before, and it's possible we may uh, submit another survey dialing it in a little bit more. But this will give us enough data to know whether or not we need to move forward to the next step. Thank you. Are there any uh, other council um, comments? Ms. So, Olagi? Um, so I just wanted to bring this up in council as we're going through this survey. Um, just for knowledge and awareness as we continue to explore and have conversation around um, local anesthesia. Oregon did a survey recently um, in the state of Oregon where they asked a different question to start their journey on local anesthesia. They asked all dentists or surveyed all dentists of what procedure would you want to add to the dental assisting scope? So I know this is a different, but it's just a different way of approaching it. And I wanted to just bring that up for awareness and knowledge as we continue conversations. Is the, these questions are great, very, but is it also in the future to ask a different question to support th this as we go forward? But that is something that um, I think we definitely should look at as a council. Um, Oregon is there, they're working on a pilot program too as well. So that is just something I wanted to bring for awareness as we have more conversation about this. Thank you. Are there any other council comments? Okay, let's open it up to public comments. Are there any public comments for this agenda item? Not seeing any public comments. Is there a motion and a, and a second? to accept these survey questions to present to the dental board. Miyasaki, I make a motion to delegate authority to the two member working group to work with OPS to finalize the surveys and distribute to stakeholders. Hulagi, second. Very good. Uh, the motion is to present the survey questions and have the council or the OPS continue working with the the work uh, the committee, <laughs> whatever. Brain just. Um, so can we uh, have board staff uh, please call roll and take votes for this agenda item? Since uh, this is now an action of the council, we need to receive public comment. I know you, you took public comment, but that was before the motion was made, ah. and we need to take public comment after. Thank you. All right. Um, is there public comments regarding the motion to accept the survey questions to present to the board? I'm sorry, I just to clarify the motion, I don't believe the survey questions would be presented to the board. This is a council action, so we're approving the questions and for the two member subcommittee to work with OPS to finalize the questions and distribute to the licensees to collect the information. So there's no need to send the questions to the board for approval at this point. Like she said. <laughs> Any public comments? No? Uh, can I now ask board staff to <laughs> um, please call roll and record the votes for this agenda item? This is Marella Turan. The motion is to delegate authority to 
to the two-member working group and to work with OPES to finalize the surveys and distribute to stakeholders. I will now call the roll. Epps Robbins. Fowler. Aye. Miyasaki. Miyasaki, aye. Olagi. Olagi, yes. Pacheco. Pacheco, aye. Pliss. Pliss, yes. Reed Espinosa. Reed Espinosa, aye. The motion passed. Thank you. So we'll now move on to agenda item nine. Update regarding administration of new RDEF written examination. I'm going to ask Ms. Tina Valerie to please present this agenda item. Thank you. On January 1st, 2022, Senate Bill 607 became effective. This bill removed the clinical and practical exam requirements to become a registered dental assistant in extended functions. This allowed the board to license RDAEF applicants that met all of the requirements listed on page 43 of your meeting materials. On January 2nd, 2022, we were able to license the 253 applicants that had been awaiting licensure due to the challenges we face scheduling the clinical and practical examinations as a result of COVID-19 impacts. Based on the results of the occupational analysis conducted by OPES, a new RDAEF written exam was developed that incorporates additional content that was previously measured by the clinical and practical exams. The new exam launched on January 28, 2022, and due to the low number of RDAEF candidates taking the exam currently, OPES is not holding the exam results. OPES is monitoring the exam performance and will perform their analyses once there has been a sufficient number of candidates that have taken the exam. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any council member comments? I have one, <laughs> or a few. Um, uh, so the January results, the January, February, and March results actually are out on the, available on the Dental Board website. The January results, result, uh, they show the old exam because it hadn't been launched yet, um, which was a 90% pass rate. Um, the previous pass rate really for the EF exam was around 80%. In February though, uh, only six exams were taken and there was a 0% pass rate, um, and that was with the new exam. In March, of 20, in March, there was 22 exams that were taken. There was a 14% pass rate, and that was also with the new exam. So I am concerned that, and I know that OPES is not holding the results, examination results yet, because they're trying to gather enough or sufficient number of candidates uh, before they actually, you know, get their analysis done. But what is the procedure or process for modifying an exam or determining if questions should be revised or reworded? That's my first question. And then the second question is, because OPES is not holding the results, if questions are determined invalid, invalid, are candidates who failed the new exam allowed to retake the exam, or what is the procedure for that? So I don't want to speak too much about OPS's process because I, I don't have all of that information, but I do know that they, um, once they perform their analyses, if there were questions that were deemed um, not um, fair or scorable that they will make the adjustments and those candidates will be notified. I don't know if, if Sarah want you want to expand on that. So board staff did meet with OPS prior to this board meeting to review the examination statistics and they have advised against making any interpretations regarding pass rates. 
or the examination performance because the number of candidates are insufficient to provide reliable results. So they continue to monitor the examination and they'll perform additional analyses once the sufficient number of candidates have taken the examination. They are consistently reviewing it. There is some overlap, as I understand it, between candidates that had actually retaken the previous written examination and that may also be contributing to the failure rate. Um, so it's, it's too early to tell at this point. OPS is consistently monitoring this and they'll be actually coming to the August meeting to provide additional information regarding the examination performance. By that time, I expect several of the programs will have produced graduates, new graduates, and will have uh, already taken the examination by the August meeting. So we should have more candidates to review results at that point. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, are there any other uh, council member comments on this agenda item? Not seeing any other council member comments. Is there any public comments on this agenda item? Yes. Hello, my name is Tuka Zokai. I'm with the California Dental Association with Health Policy. I was wondering if for the low pass rate, if there is an area of consistent failure or if there's a section that we're seeing the most, you know, failure for opportunity to strengthen. So again, OPS is consistently reviewing the results and the number of candidates unfortunately is low, so it's difficult to provide reliable results. But they do take that into consideration as they perform their analyses and I believe there'll probably be additional information at the August meeting that would, would address that question. At this point, it's too early to tell. All right, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? on this agenda item. Okay. Not seeing any other public comments. I'd like to move on to uh, agenda item 10, update regarding dental assisting comprehensive rulemaking, California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Sections 1067 to 1081.3. I'm going to ask Ms. Sarah Wallace, Interim Executive Officer, to give this report. Thank you. Previously, the Dental Assistant Council had formed work groups over several years to um, develop amendments to the board's regulations relating to dental assisting examination, application, and educational program and course requirements, which culminated in the board being um, reviewing a comprehensive rulemaking package at its December 2019 meeting and initiating a rulemaking. Um, through this time, board staff have been working with legal counsel on the language and formulating the initial rulemaking documents that need to be submitted to the Office of Administrative Law. In working with our board regulatory counsel, we've determined that there are several issues with the proposed text that may necessitate it being re-referred back to the Dental Assistant Council. Um, in order for rulemaking packages to pass OAL or Office of Administrative Law Review, they have to meet several standards um, relating to necessity, clarity, consistency, and avoiding duplication within the regulations. And so throughout the review, there were several areas which were deemed uh, to be potential issues if it were to go on to OAL review. So we will be discussing this with the board. It will most likely be re-referred back to the Dental Assistant Council. And at that point, board staff will um, request assistance from council members on the development of the language to ensure that we are capturing the requirements accurately and reorganizing the language so that it's clear to applicants, educators, and, and licensees. Um, so it's just an informational update at this point, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any council member comments? Not seeing any council member comments. Is there any uh, public comments on this agenda item? It looks like we have a 
comment from the public here. Hello, Melody Randolph representing KDAT and the Alliance. Just question, what would be your um, picture then of it going back? Because, you know, as you know, it was a painful process and many years of getting to where we are, and it sounds like we're going to go back to almost square one. What would the, are we starting over? What would the picture look like? Uh, to clarify, I, I, I'm sorry, I did not want to imply that we're starting from square one. That's not the intention. <laughs> Good. So the, the, the policy and the requirements that were involved in the rulemaking development, those aren't necessarily up for discussion. It's, it's the organization of the requirements and condensing to avoid duplication among several sections um, to make it as clear as possible and to ensure that we have um, demonstrated clearly what the necessity of each amendment is. And so um, it is not intended to start from square one or, or reevaluate. There may be questions involved that we'll need to work through, um, but it's not intended to start from square one. And so board staff um, have been working on other regulatory packages, and so we're turning our direction towards this development now. And so at this point, we'll be working with subject matter experts, our council members on the organization of the rulemaking documents and then most likely bringing it back to the council to vet out and then the board at a future date. Perfect, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, are there any other public comments on this agenda item? Okay, not seeing any other public comments. I'd like to move on to agenda item number 11. Oh, oh you're just, I'm sorry. Uh, agenda item number 11, discussion and possible recommendations on pending legislation, Assembly Bill AB 2276, Carrillo 2022 Dental Assistance. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. David Bruggeman Legislation, late, excuse me, legislative and regulatory specialist to present this agenda item. Hello, can everyone hear me? Um, yes, I am David Rugman and I'm a legislative and regulatory specialist for the board. Um, we're specifically bringing the, this particular bill to the council's attention as it addresses the practice of dental assistance. Uh, this particular bill, as it's currently written, would add a new section to the Business and Professions Code, which would allow dental assistants to conduct coronal polishing or pit and fissure sealing if certain requirements are met. Uh, the bill requires particular courses to be taken, uh, an eight-hour course in infection control, a two-hour course in the Dental Practice Act, and a board-approved course in whichever of the two procedures, either coronal polishing or pit and fissure sealing application that they seek to um, gain permission to do. And so they can only, the dental assistant can only perform these procedures under the direct supervision of a licensed dentist and only after the dental assistant has submitted evidence to the board that they have completed a board approved course in the procedure. Additionally, some amendments to the bill that were introduced would require the supervising dentist to review the pit and fissure sealant application, be listed in the record for the procedure and confirm the competency of the dental assistant along with the dental practice. The practice would have to retain records of the dental assistant's training in the procedures and retain records of the procedures for at least two years after the dental assistant has left the practice. However, these amendments did not remove the requirement that the dental assistant also submit evidence to the board that they complete a board approved course in the relevant procedure. So, the impact for the dental board would be that we would need to ramp up procedures in order to collect this evidence to develop regulations for implementing the bill and there would be a significant impact both on our workload and given the lack of a fee that we can um, that we can uh, charge for this process there would be some fiscal impact as well however we would recommend to the board, board staff would recommend to the board to support the bill if amended to remove this requirement to collect this, uh, that the board would collect this evidence. The specific practices singled out in the bill are activities that RDAs have to be trained in. Board staff anticipates that unlicensed dental assistants that would seek to complete these courses 
are more likely to uh, seek our RDA licensure, and we'd like to encourage that. Um, those that are unlicensed dental assistants that are in continuous employment for at least 120 days must have completed within a year of their employment the courses in the Dental Practice Act and infection control that would be required by this legislation. So, we again, the, the specific amendment that we'd like to have changed is to reduce the impact to the board, but board staff is supportive of, um, would recommend to the board that we would support the bill if that amendment was put into place. And at this point, um, we will leave it to the chair to discuss whether or not the board would like to make, excuse me, whether or not the council would like to make a recommendation to the board with respect to how they should approach this legislation. Um, in the meeting materials, you have the memo, which I've just summarized, but you also have the text of the bill and a letter from several uh, dental assistant organizations submitted to the board in opposition to the legislation. And I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there any council member comments on this agenda item? Kara, would you like to? Sure, Miyasaki. Um, I'm trying to wrap my head, and I just have a general question for your expertise about who can propose legislation and. Um, and let's, okay, so this is, so normally I would think that legislation should be proposed by the group that is, ha, is um, performing the duties, right? So, I mean, that's what, in my mind, so does this, is it normal for like groups, like let's say like the medical association wanted to propose like a dental therapist, could they write a bill like this and, and is this setting a precedence for something like that? So it, interested parties have the ability to encourage a legislator to sponsor a bill supporting their interests. So legislatures would be the ones actually writing the bills with the input from uh, relevant stakeholders that would be contributing to the process. So um, strictly speaking, uh, an association would not write the bill, but they would seek a legislative sponsor for legislation that they would be interested in seeing take place. So I'm sorry, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this again. Is so, let's say if something has to do with like dental hygienist duties, like they, that it normally comes from the dental hygienist and like if the medical doctors want to do something about the medical pre profession, is that generally what happens or is that not generally what happens and other, other organizations can write legislation? Like I'm saying, like the, the the California Medical Association could write like legislation to have like a dental therapist that could do like simple extractions and um, direct restorations, and and that would be something that could go as a bill before it goes to like the dental board. Well, the dental board. Does, sorry, sorry, David. Uh, I'll defer to Sarah. I'm sorry, here. Member Miyasaki. Um, the purpose of this agenda item is for us to discuss a, a bill that has been proposed by the legislature. The board has not sponsored this bill, but we do have the opportunity to have the Dental Assisting Council make a recommendation to the board. Um, for purposes of procedure on how to introduce legislative proposals, that's a little off topic to this agenda item, but we'd be happy to discuss that offline with you and, and help clarify that process. Um, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, my name is Jerry. <laughs> But uh, a couple questions. So right now, the, the uh, Corona Polishing standalone course is 12 hours. The Pitt and Fisher is 16. RDAs are trained to chemically prepare teeth, place and adjust finished direct restorations, provisional restorations, fabricate and adjust cement, and remove indirect provisional restorations. So they have training in occlusion. Uh, DAs have no occlusion training. Also, how will DAs, if, if they're allowed to place pit fissures, how would they allow, how would they adjust occlusion on sealants when they can't use hand instrumentation? It's not in their allowable duties that we have listed on the dental board website. Obviously, they can't use hand pieces. So if occlusion is high, they have no way of adjusting it. Um, so I propose that if this even went forward, which I'm opposed, 
the existing corona polishing and pit and fissure sealant courses would need to be modified to include that additional training. They, could, they would have to be longer than the 12-hour CP uh, corona polishing and the 16-hour pit and fissure. It would have to be modified to provide them more training in those areas that RDAs get, but they don't have. That's my first comment. <laughs> and then also, I noticed in the meeting notes, um, there was a comment stating that the board staff anticipated unlicensed dental assistants that seek to complete these courses to provide these procedures will be more inclined to seek RDA licensure. I don't see that. I think that if they're allowed to do that, thank you very much. And why would they go through it? Otherwise, they would already go through the RDA programs. Another way I have a comment, there was a section that mentioned in the meeting materials. Board staff recommend requesting an amendment to, re uh, to require the supervising dentist to be responsible for ensuring successful completion of the app uh, applicable board approved courses rather than require the board to track such completions. And I know that we don't have the board staff to support that. However, if we do that, there's no way of, for checking if the DA, the DA, the dental assistant, has completed those courses. So most will perform these procedures without course completion. There will be no auditing. There's no check and balance system. So they will just possibly, uh, there's no way of checking to see if they're completed. We don't have the manpower to really make sure. And those are my comments, but is there any other uh, council member comments on this agenda item? Ms. Miyasaki? Thank you. I agree with your comments, Chair Fowler, and also with the, um, with the points from the letter from the Dental Assisting Alliance. Ms. Pliss? I also agree with your comments regarding the assistants would not pursue their RDA license if they're capable of doing certain procedures in the office, and I think it would be limiting the RDAs coming in and their value, and I think that there is plenty of things that would need to be discussed with this situation. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Olagi? Um, I have a very different outlook, and I'm actually in support of this. I think saying that our profession or our colleagues would not seek RDA license is a very strong comment amongst our colleagues. Um, as far as both procedures are going to be supervised under direct supervision of a licensed dentist. So that is something that we want to consider. These are direct, not indirect, but direct supervised. Um, with that, right now, access to care, these are preventative too, sealants are preventative. Access to care is very, very important and elevating the scope of what a dental assistant can perform in our communities to help with that access to care, I do think it is something that we need to consider. Now, checks and balances, I 100% agree with that we, there needs to be some conversation around how the auditing would look, how we would be able to see um, certifications come in, all of that, but I do feel we are capable as dental assistants in the scope of a dental assistant being able to perform these functions under direct supervision of a licensed dentist. Thank you. Ms. Epps Robbins? Um, I'm kind of in, in, the, in the middle with this. Um, I do agree that this does need to be um, discussed and have the opportunity of having the expansion of timing for the education of, of this procedure. Um, 12 hours for one procedure, and I believe you said 16 or for the other. I do believe that this needs to be expanded in an educational setting. Also keeping in mind that although this is said to be under direct supervision, how are we going to have the checks and balances of that direct supervision? If you have a heavily busy practice, and you have multiple staff, multiple rooms, and only two supervising dentists, or for an example, one. If a dental assistant is in a room on their own, or an RDA in a room on their own, when will this dentist have the timing, and what would be the secured proof to show that these procedures were checked 
um, although it is recorded within the ledger and the notes of the day and signed out by the dentist, how would we know who has done what, who has checked, and where would be the supported information of that? Now, if those things can be um, addressed and those things can be secured, then I would be in um, agreement with having those duties expanded and given back to or given allowance for the DAs to be able to do that. But we also have to keep in mind, this is the reason why we have a differences of an RDA registered dental assistant and a dental assistant. So if both of these can be hybrided in some type of mannerism to be able to allow the DA to um, do these functions, although under the true meaning of direct supervision and not the lack of supervision, then I would be in agreement to this. Thank you. Are, are there any other uh, council member comments? Okay. Are there any public comments on this agenda item? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair Fowler. I, I wanted to clarify for the council. I, I have heard uh, comments relating to the educational pathway for RDA licensure, and I just want to point out that there are currently three pathways to licensure. There's education, mixed education with uh, or on the job training, and then the on the job training experience. When you look at our on-the-job training experience, currently the requirements are 15 months of, of work experience as a DA. They have to complete the two-hour basic life support course, the dental practice act course, sorry, the four-hour BLS course, the two-hour DPA course, the eight-hour infection control course. They are also required to complete the radiation safety course and the coronal polish course as it currently stands in its current hourly format to become licensed as a registered dental assistant. Those are all required to be fulfilled prior to submitting their applications to take the registered dental assistant written examination. So um, the reason board staff had recommended a support if amended position was taking into consideration these candidates who are already fulfilling their on-the-job training experience are completing these courses. A board staff had previously brought a proposal to the Dental Assistant Council, I believe it was in fall of 2018, relating to coronal polish and whether or not the coronal polish course should be required after RDA licensure. Um, and at that time, the Dental Assistant Council all agreed that it was should not be required after licensure. It was appropriate to keep it before licensure um, and that these folks are supervised by the licensed dentist. Um, we've researched our enforcement data. There's no enforcement data um, or complaint history to indicate that there is a consumer protection risk um, associated with coronal polishing or pit and fissure sealants at this point in time. So uh, for that perspective, I don't feel that there's a inherent safety risk. Um, we are talking about a group that would be able to perform these functions. It would help move them along the pathway to become licensed as registered dental assistants. It would expand their scope. Um, and for that reason, we had recommended a support if, if amended. Currently, dental assistants who have to complete the basic life support course, the eight-hour infection control course, um, the radiation safety course, if there is a complaint lodged with the board and an investigator goes out, then we're checking those records at that time. Um, it's not necessarily an ongoing audit. But again, we do not have the enforcement statistics to, to dictate that there's a public safety risk at this time. So I just wanted to share that information and that perspective for that pathway. Thank you. Are there any other council comments? Okay, let's move on to public comments on this agenda item. Hi, uh, this is Mary McCune with the California Dental Association. Um, we are the sponsors of this bill, and I just wanted to let the council know that the language of this bill is heavily in flux. We are working, um, we're trying to be utmost or as close to moving forward in a consensus-based fashion. We do have strong support in the legislature, but we are also trying to work with other stakeholders on this bill, including those that um, submitted an opposition letter. And so the things that we are looking at at this point are um, <clears throat> taking out sealants from this so it would only be focused on coronal polishing, um, looking at the patient safety, keeping that kind of a pillar of, of this bill, and um, looking at how things can be enforced while also 
making any um, any things anything that would be um, put to the dental board minimal. So any costs or enforcement issues, such as creating a permit, trying to keep those as minimal as possible. Um, and looking at how we can really, um, to Ms. Olagi's point before, really look at how direct supervision can be um, squared in on the coronal polishing for unlicensed DAs through um, mechanisms of looking at the, the, the medical record for that service and having the licensed supervising dentist um, not only look at the um, service before completion, but also mark their name on that as well. So if there is an enforcement, even though they can't go directly after the unlicensed dental assistant by nature of them not being licensed, there will be a direct link between that person, the licensed supervising dentist, who it, it's ultimately their responsibility at the end of the day, and the um, the, the patient lodging the complaint. Um, so we'll keep the, the both the council and the dental board apprised of the ongoing conversations that are happening, but still at the same time um, urge a support at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Bruce Witcher, California Dental Association. Again, I think the point here is the position that's being recommended is supportive amendment amended, and I think you'll be seeing amendments coming through that will address many of your concerns, as Mary outlined for you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public member comments? Good morning, Claudia Pohl, um, CDAA and the Alliance. Um, our letter is in the packet, so I'm not gonna belabor it, but we are at this point taking an opposed position, but we are working on amendments and anticipate you know, collaborating as best we can that will address our concerns as outlined in our letter. Thank you. Public comments? Melody Randolph, KDAT and the Alliance. And just wanna reiterate um, our agreement that uh, with Jerry Fowler's comment that um, this, I see in no way, being an educator over 30 years, dental assisting educator, how this would encourage people to take the RDA. You're taking things, it doesn't make any sense. We're taking things away from the RDA. Why would people then, if they can do it without being an RDA, continue to seek becoming an RDA? This is, um, in our opinion, destroying the career ladder as opposed to helping to build the career ladder as it's been stated in the past. Um, and second comment is we are in favor of a um, permit and it's our understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's our understanding if the Corona Polish became a permit and the applicants would have to submit an application and get a permit from the dental board and pay a fee that the fees for the permit would support and cover the costs of the administration of the permit. Correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. So this is a point of information for the council when it relates to legislation and amendments that impact our program, staff develop fiscal impact analyses that we share with the legislature. At this point in time, such an amendment would require additional board staff uh, and resources to be able to put that permit category together. We have adequate staff right now for the licenses and permits that we issue for dental assisting, but any additional workload, we would need to complete a workload analysis. We would need to assess a fee, which could be high, um, and have to put a workload analysis together to um, be able to implement and have the resources necessary to put that into action. Are we still taking public comment? Just speaking as a uh, practicing dentist who works in an access clinic, uh, we do hire an RDA, something I didn't do when I was in oral surgery practice, but the additional duties of the RDA are significant Fabricating temporary crowns is one thing that we really need to have them do. And so even though if they could do coronal polish, I think there'd still be quite a bit of incentive. I know we would pay the RDA uh, increase in salary necessary to recruit and retain an RDA if we could ever find one. 
But uh, the additional duties are something really essential, I think, to every dental practice. So I think it's maybe you know, not quite accurate to say that this will destroy the incentive to become an RDA. I would disagree with that. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Okay, at this point, I'd like to ask if we have a motion to um, support as amended, or if amended, or support to oppose. Do we have a motion for this agenda? I motion Olagi to support if amended. If support if amended. amended. Board's recomm um, staff's recommendation. And just to clarify, the amendment would to be removed the, the requirement for the certificate of completion to be submitted, submitted to, the, to board. the board. Yes. Okay. Reed Espinoza, opposed. So I believe we'll, we'll need to see if first need to see if there's a motion on the floor. So we'll need to see if there's a second to Ms. Olagi's motion. Is there a discussion after the second? Is that what happens? It can be discussed and then public comment and then it'll be voted on. Okay, can we discuss now or no? We, we need a second. Okay. Is there a second to uh, Dr. La uh, doctor, you're now a doctor. Congratulations. <laughs> I assume, I know. Um, Ms. Alagi's uh, support if amended m motion. Is there a second for that? Seeing no second f uh, for support if amended, um, that motion fails. Is there an additional um, motion that might be different that the council would like to make? Or does this require further discussion? Okay, Ms. Ms. Miyasaki. Um, are we in the discussion phase or are you still asking for a motion? I'm sorry. Uh, I was asking for a motion if we get that for, but if we're not ready, we're ready to discuss more. Okay, so let's go ahead, Ms. Miyasaki, go ahead and is there a way that we could see the amendments before we actually, I mean, I, I personally would oppose as it writ, is written now, but I would most likely move to a watch if we were able to see the amendments. Is it a way for us that to be kicked back to us before it goes to the dental board, um, the amended final version before it goes to the dental board or is that not possible? So right now, today, we have the amendments that we see in our board meeting packets. That's the published version. Um, any amendments that I've heard discussed today seem to be forthcoming in a, in a new version when the committees meet, the legislative committees meet. So in the interest of transparency in a public board meeting, no, at this point, we would need to consider the version that we have in our board meeting packets um, to make your recommendation to the board, and then the board would decide to take a position at that time. If it's determined that there needs to be another special meeting in between, then that would be at the discretion of the board. But the next opportunity to discuss this bill at this point would be in August, which is towards the final deadlines for the legislative calendar. Okay, are there any motions at this point then regarding what we have here existing as it's written? Ms. Miyasaki? Move to oppose the bill. Uh, uh, opposition? Is there a second to uh, Ms. Miyasaki's? Opposed. Ms. Pliss? Opposed. 
So, Ms. Miyazaki, op um, opposition to uh, the agenda item as it's written? So this would be a recommendation to the board to oppose AB 2276, is the motion. Ms. So Miyazaki. I, so I just want clarification because this is a really heavy issue and um, as I mentioned before, if we were able to see the amendments, the final version, I would most likely um, watch or approve it, but because we don't see the amendments and we don't have a chance to see the amendments before it goes to the board, the way it's written now, I, so that's why I keep, I'm asking whether we can see the amendments or not. And, and unfortunately, because the way it's written now, I see um, problems with the language. Um, it says uh, the dental practice should determine competency and a dental practice is not like a person. Like there's examples of, of the wording in the bill that um, I think need to be changed. I know that the amendments probably are, are addressing that. We don't need to go that, through that um, word by word. But again, I guess I'm just asking if there's a way that we could see the amendments before we actually make a motion or action on this item. If not, then my, um, my opposition motion stands. I'm seeing, um, I'm, I kind of agree in, with you, uh, Ms. Miyazaki, in the sense that I think I'm feeling that a lot of us would like to support this, um, but we feel uncomfortable with approving what we have in front of us. And so if we could see that rewritten, I think you would get a lot of support for this. So, so to clarify, this is not a board bill, it's not a board staff bill. We, we do not have access to the amendments, and so what we're presenting today is what's available publicly in the version that's, that's currently accepted by the legislature. So the council today can discuss a recommendation to the board. You can recommend to support if amended with the staff recommendation. You can recommend to oppose. You can recommend to watch. You could also recommend any amendments that you would like to see. But at this point, um, I think we're, we're discussing a, a version of a bill that none of us know what's in it, and that's not on the table for discussion at this point. So the council has those options. If you would like to take a recommend a watch position or recommend an opposed position, we would ask you to include a, a, a rationale as to why so that Chair Fowler can share that with the board in her report tomorrow. Um, when the board does take a position on a bill, they issue a letter to the appropriate committee in the author's office indicating why the position has been taken. So the council at this point has all of those options available. Um, if there are specific amendments that you would like to see, you're welcome to discuss those and make that as part of your recommendation as well. Sarah, so just a clarifying question, I think, because we do have a lot of new DAC members to help support this. So as we said, we are in support of this with specific amendments. So if that was added to it, we can write that we do support with additional amendments besides what staff has recommended, correct or n incorrect? Correct. Correct. The council can determine what amendments they would recommend that the board consider. So we could add those concerns that we would like to bring as an amendment and then support this, and that would be in the letter. So I just want to kind of give us a moment to think about that, and if that is something we, we, we make the motion with those additional amendments. I think that's a valid point. Um, myself, personally, I would like to see this extended a little bit more with a little bit more information and clarity. Um, I am not personally protective over the RDA versus the DA and the functions. I do think that um, being an educator that it is utmost important to be able to move a DA forward to that RDA status and to be able to have still clarity of an RDA function and a DA function protecting the RDA as their work and their effort of taking that exam and you know forwarding their career. Um, I would like to see a little bit more information within this in order to make a final decision. And um, I do support um, Ms. Misaki's, I'm sorry, Ms. Misaki's um, information as well as I support others that have spoken. But I would like to see a little bit more before I make a final determination. 
Ms. Miyazaki. Um, so I just really appreciate everyone's comments um, for the Dental Assisting Council. And I, I just think um, being involved with the different associations that I, I think the amendments are much more, the ones that are being looked at right now by the CDA and the ed educators, which I know are probably promising that it's way different than the language that we have now, that, that we're in, in the meeting materials. So I don't think that even if I go line by line that it's, it's really not gonna cover the more comprehensive amendments that I think are being worked on right now. So board legal counsel reminded me the council also has the option of taking, recommending a watch position with concerns and listing your concerns and then Chair Fowler could provide those recommendations to the board as part of the report as well. So if you have general concerns that you want to have issued, um, we can discuss those. I would ask for specific concerns um, in order to, to provide the board with the best information possible. Okay. Um, I think that's an excellent plan to let's uh, move to watch with concerns and some of the concerns that I would like to bring up are if they're allowed to do the pit and fish. Oh. So um, we have a motion and a second on the table, um, move to oppose. Um, and I just heard you say um, move to watch. So we, we should, for um, clarity in the record, um, go ahead and deal with the first motion um, and get public comment on the motion to oppose and then take a vote. And then we can, uh, you know, if, if necessary, if that motion fails, we can continue to discuss additional motions. Thank you. Okay, so on the motion to oppose, are you still in favor of that, Kara? Ms. Miyasaki? Or Ms. Lagi? Um, legal counsel, just again, because we do have to DAC members, there was a question. If a motion was made to oppose, they can retract, correct? Or is that incorrect? They can retract or they can revise it revise. as long as the second um, agrees to the revision. Thank you. So, um, yes, I, Ms. Miyasaki, seeing how you motioned, would you like to modify the motion? Um, I think maybe I'll retract the motion at this point and um, gosh, it's hard. so, okay, I'll retract the motion right now. I'll second the retraction. Okay. Would you, um, Chair Fowler, like to go ahead with your um, discussion on a possible motion to watch with specific concerns uh, listed to provide to the board? Okay, so I understand the uh, motioning to watch with concerns, meaning we're not neither opposed nor, um, you know, for the, uh, the item, it's just that we would like to see certain things happen before we could make a decision, am I correct? So watch letters are, they're neutral and they don't necessarily give any weight either way. Um, so sometimes they're disregarded by the stakeholders and the author. Um, if you, you know, have a, a an idea the concept that you agree with. Sometimes you want to do a support. We agree with the concept. If um, uh, amended to address concerns, that way you can um, state, stake out a position. You could say, you know, we like the concept, but we're not in support fully right now because we have these concerns that need to be addressed. That's more of a, um, it, it conveys a message to the author that they could get support if they, you know, go ahead and address these these concerns. Uh, the, all, the opposite of that is oppose unless amended to address specific concerns. That one's, you know, uh, I think a lot of authors look at those a lot more closely because they want support. 
Watch letters, on the other hand, they're just kind of, okay. yeah, we're in the middle. We have these concerns. So, you know, if this sounds like uh, a topic of uh, serious nature and everyone mm -hmm. is really passionate about specific things about this bill. So, um, you know, consider the passion level here and yes. whether or not you agree with the concept um, and then you could lean toward, if you agree with the concept, do okay. support if amended to address specific concerns. You don't have to necessarily say, you know, every problem with the bill, but you could do a general, you know, um, address uh, uh, education, um, you know, address the fees problem, address how the board would implement or enforce this. Um, so those are general concepts you could just list quickly. Alternatively, if uh, the council members are more opposed to, to this concept, um, perhaps you would do an oppose unless amended to water it down or fix it in specific ways. So um, you have the three options, support, watch, oppose. Um, watch is just a lot more watered down. Okay. I'm so glad this meeting is in person. <laughs> I could not get that type of clarification, I think, uh, via online. I mean, I think this, that was wonderful. I believe that I'd like to oppose if amended. That's the stance that I would like to do. Um, I'd like to motion that, and then I'd like to address the items that I would like amended. Before I go... Go ahead. I want to be clear. You said oppose if amended. Unless amended. Okay. Very good. So oppose unless amended. Great. Thank you. Yes. Oppose unless amended. But before I go into detail about what those items are, I'd like to hear from the council members on what they feel about that. Uh, go ahead, Brian. Ms. Miyazaki. So I have a question for the legal analyst. Um, if perhaps we have um, like a, a kitchen item list of things, and if does everyone have to agree on all the kitchen item list of things for the action, or can or can it just be forwarded to the dental board? They can see who who wants that, how many people are in the dental system council are in favor of that item or not? Because I can see if we have like maybe 20 items here. Maybe someone's in opposition of like one or two. Does that mean that it, the action does that is that make or break for the action for the action that's being on proposed? I would say that it's better to list what the concerns are generally. That way, you're you have the ability to get more support for this position since there have been many different opinions expressed on this. So, uh, if it's opposed unless amended to address general concerns, then the board receiving that can, um, uh, through their board president, work with stakeholders or the legislature to, you know, tweak specific language. You don't, you can't do that right now because you haven't seen any amendments to fix any of this, so. Um, I would say that if you're going for you know, a laundry list, you may or may not get the support for that motion right now with these council members. On the other hand, if the council can agree generally that there are specific concerns, then the motion may uh, have more success. Um. Oh, Ms. Reed Espinoza, I'm sorry, right next to you. Okay, so I agree with this concept. This is a, a wonderful thing. We're very limited with our DA, RDA, and the EFs coming in and um, into the general career path. It, the, I'm concerned with maybe just dividing this. It would go a little bit better doing pit and fissure sealant is a little bit different than coronal polishing in the fact of isolation a da is a person coming off the street that doesn't have a complete education of the dental 
mouth in general. And so having them doing isolation properly to handle a sealant versus coronal polishing is a, is a concern for me. Um, supervising secondary is a really big concern as we had stated before, when you're working in a large atmosphere with a clinic, say, and you maybe have two supervising dentists, they're in doing crown preps while a DA potentially can be doing a sealant and, and that's not a direct situation where if the child that is in the chair is unmanageable, those types of things are a little bit more of a concern for me in regards to supervision. And then a fee um, to, to be able to supervise this, um, concerned about that as well. Thank you. Um, I believe Ms. Epps Robbins has her part. I want to um, oppose this unless amended. Um, I do strongly believe that it does need to have some things that are amended. Um, also, the new concerns that were pointed out that, that really brings in another way to look at it. If you do have um, an auxiliary who is u utilizing their skills as a DA, and they don't have that supervising dentist. That's my main concern of having that supervision and how is it going to be checked? Who is going to um, take the responsibility for it and the accountability if there's something that is missed within the process of dismissal of that patient from a DA? So um, I am going to stand kind of firm on the pose unless amended. Reed Espinosa, second. Okay, so uh, Chair Fowler made a motion to oppose unless amended. Um, so I'm, um, we're starting to get lost in the motions a little bit. Um, Ms. Epps Robbins uh, expressed her strong oppose unless amended. So I'm wondering if Ms. Epps Robbins would like to second Chair Fowler's motion to oppose unless amended. I will second. Chair Fowler's, unless I amended. Okay, at this point, do we need to go into the, the sections that we want amended before we move on? Um, Ms. Miyasaki it looked like she had a additional comments. Okay, okay. Yeah, so I think at this point um, you've got a motion on the table and a second. It's um, opposed unless amended. And yeah, I think now's a good time to delineate what concerns go okay. along with, with that opposed unless amended. All right, thank you. Um, I would like to oppose unless amended um there's there needs to be the sealant should almost be taken off the table and that was possible legislation changes and I'm, i really am hoping that does occur the only the reason it would be taken off the table it would if it didn't get taken off the table it would require much more additional training to get them to that point other than that uh 16 hour course so I think taking it off the table is a lot cleaner, leaving with the corona polishing. Um, also, the checks and balances uh, for once they complete the course, like uh, for the corona polishing, there is, no, uh, there is no board approval or that as it is right now. Um, it's just kept in practice with the general supervision with the dentist saying that, hmm, they're keeping track of that. Um, I believe that there, be sh there should be some kind of a, a accountability, checks and balances that's written in. Um, otherwise, people, I think I really truly believe the DAs are just going to say in the practices that, yep, we're, we're licensed to do that when, when indeed they may not be. Uh, those are my two main issues. 
The other one would be if they did want to move forward with the Pitt and Fisher, once again, it would have to be longer training. We'd also have to rewrite the legislation to, be a, to give them some means of being able to adjust that occlusion. Right now, there isn't. So great, they could place them, but you can, unless the dentist comes back there and adjusts the occlusion, they have no way legally to adjust the occlusion. So we would have to modify that, their allowable duties for the DA. Um, those are my main amendments. Um, Ms. Miyasaki? I agree with the sealants, and I think they're a different animal if they could be removed as part of the uh, amendments. Um, I agree with the accountability part and with the possibility of a fee that's tied to a permit. And also, I believe that there should be a renewal, um, a required eight hour infection control renewal. Uh, and dental practice that for the um, some sort for they to um, maintain the accountability piece as well. Thank you. Ms. Reed Espinosa. Um, once again, I would agree to separate the sealant versus the coronal polishing. I'd also agree with to permitting it rather than certify so they can hold a permit that would, they would have to be accountable for. Um, supervising, maybe we can add an additional supervising that a hygienist could come in in regards to supervising with the coronal polishing. Are there any other uh, council member comments? Would the council be open to supervision by a licensed dental professional? So it could be an RDH, RDA, or DDS. For the Corona polishing? Yes. yes. Um, I'm, I'm in favor. And also, um, I think we should discuss the supervision, um, whether people feel strongly about the supervision, if it should be direct or general. I'd like to hear from the council members. I believe it should be direct for the supervision. Um, I don't think that it needs to be general. Um, I do believe that it needs to be direct that way. It could be overseen. Okay, uh, any other comments regarding supervision level? So, uh, Ms. Epps Robbins suggested it should be direct, not general. Anybody else like to make? I agree, it should be direct. Direct. Okay. All right, so direct. At this point, Unless there's other uh, council member comments. We're still in the motion phase. Is this something I open to the public first? Okay, so since you're still in the motion phase and you just had a list of items, I think we need to cinch up the list. And then um, your second on the motion needs to agree to this list uh, being added to the motion. And then you can open it up to the public. Do you, do you have a, a list you feel confident in? I can tell you what I have. Um, these were all of the suggestions and some of them were um, um, repeated. Yeah, so um, we've got remove uh, pit and fissure sealant, but okay to leave the coronal polishing. Um, I have address checks and balances, um, which is very nebulous, but perhaps that gets addressed with the uh, concept to require an application and renewal of a permit uh, and charge a fee for that. Um, so it would be remove sealant, 
uh, apply and renew a permit. Um, with that renewal would be uh, additional CE, which is the eight hour infection control and dental practice act. And then with respect to supervision, um, we have supervision by a licensed dental professional um, and the supervision needs to be direct. Carol, would you like to make Could comment? we add to the list for the renewal, the basic life support um, certification? Did, did I also hear you mention the eight hour infection control course or was it just the two hour, the four hour? BLS? My apologies, the regular one that's required for. Um, the, the two hour mm -hmm. infection control and the basic life support. Yes, thank you. Would you also require the DPA? I think in order to be consistent with the renewals for the dentist, the hygienist, and the RDAs and the EFs, that it would be the two and two, whatever we have for Dental Practice Act and um, infection control and, and basic life support. Thank you. I just have one, I just want to make sure that staff are understanding the purpose of the checks and balances and the accountability because we are discussing unlicensed dental assistants so they are, they're not licensed and by issuing a permit then we start going into an enforcement aspect and unlicensed dental assistants are supervised by the dentist so if we do have a complaint and they're found to be in violation ultimately the dentist is responsible and we would enforce, take administrative action on that license. It's possible and it would be, there would be parity with what's an existing law for unlicensed dental assistance for the supervising dentist to be responsible for ensuring that the certificate of completion is on file in their office. Is that an option that the council would want to consider rather than creating a permitting structure for the board? Ms. Miyazaki. Would it be possible to ask when the dentist renews their license that they certify on their renewal something like this or is that not possible? Well, I, I would say that the dentist is always responsible for the supervision of their dental assistant and for ensuring that their licenses are also, so an RDA or an RDAEF that they've complied with all of their continuing education requirements for their CE renewal. So I don't know that it would be necessary to, to go that extra step. It's something that the council can consider. Um, but I'm, I just wanna bring up that when we create permitting structures, it's important that we're identifying the necessity for doing so and what the end result would be. What, what is it that we're hoping to achieve out of establishing a permitting structure? Because issuing a permit and charging a fee and charging a renewal fee for something, we just need to make sure that it's in the interest of consumer protection, what the necessity is. And those are the types of questions we would be asked and I anticipate the board would probably ask staff that as well as we present these recommendations. So. I would ask for that clarification. So we do have the option of requiring the supervising dentist to be that checks and balances and it would be in statute and it's possible to define it as unprofessional conduct if a dentist doesn't um, ensure that the certificates of completion are on file in their office um, and that way disciplinary action could, or administrative disciplinary action could be taken against the dentist. So there's additional ways to, to view it and approach it. So thank you, Sarah, for clarifying that. I, um, I guess what my concern is, is that an unlicensed dental assistant doesn't receive a, the life scan fingerprinting either or the background check, so they could possibly have like a, maybe a felony conviction, conviction or, um, and, 
still be working in a dental office or where they're not just, I think in other states they've had issues with like pedophiles working in pediatric practices and that, I mean, it's up to, it would be up to the dentist, like Sarah says, for them to ensure, do their own background check. I just think that the background check done by the board like vets out that kind of um, person that we would not want in a, in a dental practice. So that's why I just, I, I go back and forth on this. I know the dentist is responsible and I understand that. Um, they have a lot on their plate too as well and I don't, I, 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 just, I just sort of question that. I'd just like to add that in addition to um, if you move away from the permit structure for this um, and instead um, do some belts and suspenders for the dentist um, discipline for failing to ensure uh, this, you know, DA uh, is properly um, trained or educated, um, the, the bill may need to also add an additional provision for um, discipline against this um, individual because they are, if there's no permit, there's no license. So um, it's difficult to start, you know, for staff and then attorneys to link up what activity this unlicensed person did that a statute authorizes them to do, but they didn't quite, you know, meet all of the standards. So. Um, I would recommend that the bill, um, if it does not go toward permitting, that it include some provision to uh, specify the disciplinary or um, enforcement action the board can take against this, uh, the unlicensed individual. Whether that's um, uh, the board may issue a citation uh, for failure to comply with this um, statute uh, and then uh, as Ms. Wallace indicated, um, adding that unprofessional conduct provision for discipline against the dentist. Once again, uh, the, the challenge of not, the certification was kind of a, I understand, um, it's, complicated it's going to require this and is that do we really want the DA for just corona polishing to jump through all these hoops and requires the renewal and all that and then but if we ask um, for say research certification isn't required then once again we have people where we put in the hands of the dentist to monitor this it's and there could be possibly some kind of a um, uh, penalty if they don't comply, if they don't make sure that the DA's certificated or whatever has gone through this training. We don't have a, a way of checking whether or not that's occurred. We don't have this manpower to, to find out if those practices are doing that. So the penalty is kind of a, don't you dare, but no one's going to enforce it. That's what I'm, that's what I'm concerned about. So I'm kind of like trying to figure out how um, for the corona polishing. We could, if we do, go the route of uh, saying there's no certification. That means we're saying basically there's no checks and balances. There's no way of really, truly, um, it's their word of honor. For corona polishing, how do you, how does the board or the council feel about that? about saying uh, no certification or renewal for the corona polishing. Uh, Ms. Miyasaki? So um, I know that this will go forward to the dental board and I think that um, there could be a provision that we could urge for a certification or permit, but if that's not, is that something, something the dental board um, is likely to um, look at then there I agree with the legal analyst that if there could be provisions in the um, bill for some sort of enforcement action um, and also uh, the professional conduct um, does that I, I think I 
I don't know if I wrote that down correctly, but I know that we talked about the enforcement action and, and also the, could you restate that? Um, so it's uh, unprofessional conduct and then a formal disciplinary proceeding against the dentist and then just a citation against the um, unlicensed dental assistant because unlicensed individuals are, uh, can only be cited under existing law. They can't be formally disciplined because there's no license to discipline. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Reed Espinosa. I would oppose if there was no either certification or permitting to a DA. Um, I think that looking on more of a progressive, maybe this would help them in their career path in that they could have this certification and then moving forward, potentially doing the other certifications on their route to an RDA or an RDA EF. So I would um, oppose not having a certification or permit under the DA. Are there any other council member discussion regarding this requiring the amendment of the certification or of the corona polishing? Or how do you feel? Are you in agreement with Ms. Rita Espinosa regarding requiring certification and renewal? Ms. Miyasaki. I agree with the certification um, with the caveat that if that's something the dental board does not agree with that um, to recommend the to include a recommendation for the enforcement action and the provision for professional conduct and citation. And I'd like to hear from the other general, the council members. Ms. Luggy. So I would say no to the certification and agree more of like with this we are practicing as dental assistants under direct supervision of that licensed dentist. So that is why I lean towards not requiring that additional certification or that permit route. We are practicing both of these functions under the direct supervision of the licensed dentist. Okay. Uh, Ms. Reed Espinosa, um, do you agree with what Ms. Miyasaki said? I agreed with Kara. Okay, as far as I understand, back to the motion. It is up uh, the, I was, I'll go back to my notes here. I motion to oppose unless amended. And those items were to remove the Pitt and Fisher component to require certification and renewal of corona polishing, BLS, infection control, um, with possible disciplinary action measures taken, that is a possible another route, if you go. Uh, disciplinary actions taken for the DA as well as the supervising dentist. Um, the, it could be, it should be direct supervision, but that direct supervision can be with a licensed staff, DDS, RDH, RDA, EF, or RDA. We're talking about the corona polishing. Um, Ms. Epps, uh, you seconded. Uh, do you second? with those revisions or is there something else you'd like I to? I second with those revisions. I'm fine with that. Okay, I can ask now. Okay, so I'd like now to ask for public comment regarding this agenda item.
Thank you. Good morning, council members. I'm Anthony Lum, executive officer of the Dental Hygiene Board. I just wanted to inform you that um, the verbiage that was discussed about amendments in regards to possibly dental hygienists overseeing the coronal polishing aspect, dental hygienists can't supervise DAs or RDAs. That's reserved for the RDHAP category, and they can hire DAs, but that's about it. So under this bill, the, the direct supervision would come from the licensed dentist only. Thank you. Thank you. Melody Randolph, KDAT, and the Dental Assisting Alliance, two things. One, I'd just like to remind us what the definition of direct supervision is, is that the dentist has to be in the building somewhere. Um, there used to be, prior to 2010, that the along with that, the dentist had to check the work before the patient was dismissed, but that is no longer current regulatory language, um, and the dentist does not have to check um, the work when they're done. So it just means that they're in the building somewhere and as was stated before they could be in the middle of surgery and not even know what's going on somewhere else um, and the damage to the patient could already be done or be unbeknownst to them because the patient was already dismissed. Um, second, I think we need to be really careful to clarify we're using the term permit and certification interchangeably here and they're two totally different things. If you're requiring somebody to take a coronal polish course, they receive a certificate. That is not given to the dental board. Um, in this case, would not be given to the dental board necessarily. They would be given a certificate and you're saying that the office would have to watch that. A permit is totally different. The permit would be something the dental board would give to the um, uh, permittee and so I think we need to make sure we clarify and make sure we know what we're voting on here, whether it be a permit or a certificate, because they're two totally different things. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, Dr. Lori Glardy, representing the Foundation for Allied Dental Educators. Um, Allied Dental Education, excuse me. So I um, concur with everything the council's been discussing and would also like to encourage you to look at a couple more things to add on your laundry list. One being educational requirements. Um, so currently in regulations, it would be 1070.2 item 8A as an apple. You have for an RDA education program, individuals coming into that program with an open entry modular are basically unlicensed dental assistant. There is minimum education and content that they need to have prior to working on a patient. So if you don't add that in, now once again you're setting up a different standard for a dental assistant that may be going into an RDA program, they may never finish, but they have to have X amount of education before they can take Corona Polish versus this individual that may be able to take Corona Polish after they finish infection control or the DPA. So that section specifically says programs that admit students in phases, including modular or open entry, shall provide at a minimum basic instruction in tooth anatomy, tooth morphology, basic chairside skills, emergency and safety precautions, infection control, and sterilization protocols associated with any required for patient treatment. Such instruction shall incur occur prior to any other program content and prior to performance or activities involving patients. So I would encourage you to use those same regulations that are already there as far as minimal education requirements for a person that is seeking to take the Corona Polish course. In addition, I believe there should be some minimum work experience requirement. 
Currently, to take the RDA, you have to have minimal requirements, either the 15 months or the 800 education that includes X amount of hours of clinical experience. These individuals are coming from, who knows, working as a food service one day to now working and being able to hold a handpiece <laughs> Um, plus whatever other, you know, work with dental materials they're not familiar with, in addition to any kind of medical me emergency, allergic reaction, they know nothing about. So I think work experience is also really important, and that would be clinical work experience as you're working through this. Um, so those are just some suggestions that I would encourage you to look at if you're going to oppose this and amend it and definitely need education as well as some clinical work experience prior to being able to take this course. Okay. Um, my last comment would be if you don't have any additional renewal for this individual, why would a person maintain their RDA when they could not renew their RDA, would they still be considered able to Corona Polish if they've already taken the course as part of their RDA requirements? So, and then Pitt and Fisher, I, I think that that should not be a requirement because currently to even take the Pitt and Fisher course, you have to have taken the Corona Polish course. So it's not either or, <laughs> it would have to be both unless that was amended as well. But, for those of you that have been as round as long as I have, Pitt and Fisher started as a hygiene duty, then it went to an EF duty, then it went to an RDA duty. Corona Polish used to be post licensure, then it went part of the program, and now it's that you could take the course prior to applying for your RDA. The skill and knowledge hasn't changed, just the individual qualifications, and I don't think that's fair to the public. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Okay. Are there any other council member comments before we move forward? Ms. Miyasaki. So I agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Gallardi's points about the minimum um, clinical work experience. I'm wondering if that could be added to the motion and also to reiterate the certification with the renewal. I, I know what, that's already been discussed ad nauseum, um, but I do agree with Dr. Gallardi about if we have a renewal, the RDA could let their DA, their, their license lapse and then um, continue to chrome polish as a DA. Any other uh, council member comments? Ms. Miyasaki, um, do we need to be probably very specific if we wanted to add as part of the motion what minimal work experience needs to happen? Correct? Um, For on the job training, there's 15 months for RDA licensure. There's 15 months of OJT that's required to become licensed as a registered dental assistant. So is the council wanting to require 15 months of on the job experience before they could take the Corona polishing course? No. I don't think that much. But it would be nice to have clinical time. Can you use your program? It would be, I think, behoove us to have clinical time as suggested um, so they can see, you know, materials in action. So maybe having a required time in regards to clinical time would be good. Ms. Miyasaki. Um, so I think maybe the the discussion was asking whether we wanted to have like a certain number of hours, and I think maybe we can follow the general advice of keeping it sort of like a general concept and letting the organizations who are involved with the amendments to um, hash that out, and just keeping it to requiring a minimal uh, a minimal number of clinical work experience hours or months or length of time. 
that's that's acceptable but this is the council's opportunity to make a recommendation so if you want to make a specific recommendation to forward to the board for consideration now is the time to specify what that time frame would be it's likely a question that would if the board was to accept the recommendation and move forward with a proposal or a position to the legislature it's likely that question will be asked of the board so in general um, when hiring somebody they can go 30 60 90 days in a probationary period so I think maybe 120 days um, on the job training after probationary period is met could be our start for them Uh, Ms. Pliss? I would agree no less than that. Just thinking about training employees in the past and how long it takes to get them accustomed to the office and the materials specific to that dentist and everything. I think there's a lot going on. And if they're a dental assistant without the background training of the minimal education in dental materials, then it may be a longer period of time. And so I would not personally go less than 120 days. Okay. Ms. Epps Robbins. Um, I agree. I would not go under 120 days. Um, keeping in mind that um, currently, a lot of times that you will have a sterilizer that then will be trained or rolled over into the position as a DA. And then that DA then assumes responsibilities, depending on the day of uh, treatment. If there's a backlog of patients and they need to put that DA into that service role and to go into the background of working on a patient or it could be a front office personnel who has not worked in the back for quite some time we need to set a standard and a precedence of a time to allow um, enough patient care and enough times of those procedures so making that ballot of let's say you say 120 days but in actuality that staff member has only worked on three patients depending on the day and the schedule and what those procedural um, needs are, we need to be able to say or maybe set a precedence of amount of patients versus hours of patients. Therefore, we can track that a little bit more in detail to say you've surveyed and seen 50 patients or whatever that standard may be. But when you hourly categorize something um, depending on that practice, depending on if it's an ortho practice and they have the DA and they say, oh, hey, my DA can do this. Ortho practices do not do pit and fissure sealants. They do coronal polishing possibly post or pre-orthodontic placement. However, you need to see each and every different fac facility as its facility and demand of patient care. So 120 days I think would be sufficient. I don't think that um, 15 months, I think that's a little extensive, or maybe we could actually extend that out to a four month period of time. Um, again, that's a good point to say that you have the 90 day probation period, but I think it should be extended a little bit past that as well. Because within that 90 day period, there may be education as far as getting acclimation to the office, getting acclimation to charting, getting acclimation to um, radiographic procedures and duties versus actual placement of pit and fissures, and actual procedures of coronal polishing. Thank you. Ms. Salagi? I'm learning, leaning more towards 30 days. Um, I've worked in 200 plus practices, trained over 5,000 dental assistants successfully, and that would be my recommendation of in partnering with clinicians, dentists, licensed dentists, and training dental assistants, I would lean towards 30 days. Okay, so we're back to the original motion, correct? Yes. Um, okay, so I think you need to clarify your motion. And um, we had, um, I, does someone have the original four? And then you need to consider whether or not you wanna add minimum clinical work experience. Yes. Um, in a, a number of 30 days or 120 days. Okay. So the original motion 
was to oppose, unless amended, uh, remove the Pitt and Fisher component, require certification or, and renewal of C, uh, Corona Polishing BLS infection control, um, and or a possibly disciplinary action, action if the supervising dentist and the DA um, do not maintain certification. Um, direct supervision, but apparently that direct supervision is by DDS. And then um, 120 day uh, or four months work experience as a DA before taking the Corona Polishing course. Ms. Epps Robbins, do you second? I second. Okay, at this time you should receive additional public comment on your amended motion. Thank you. Is there public comment on this motion? Hi, Dr. Lori Gallardi again. I would encourage you to look at hours maybe instead of days, because what constitutes a day? I mean, could be one hour in that day, and they say they did 120 days, so maybe multiply it out <laughs> to equal X amount of hours <laughs> as far as that goes, and then there's no confusion that they met that requirement or didn't meet that requirement. Thank you. Melody Randolph, I would just like to also suggest that you add some wording in there that the hours be in direct patient care procedures instead of just 120 hours in the office. They could be sterilizing, setting up a room or whatever, but that doesn't mean they can suction. They know how to put the handpiece on the hose. That doesn't mean, you know, um, so I think to clarify, the hours need to be in direct patient care activities. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? No? Um, can we once again revisit the motion or is it a done deal? Yes, oh, you can am amend your motion. Um, can we, on the uh, 120, four month uh, work experience as a DA before taking the Corona Polishing course, uh, 120 day, can we say working uh, with patients in a clinical setting? Can we modify to say that? It, it's at the council's discretion if the motioner and the seconder want to accept that. Um, just as a point of clarification for the hours, 120 days with eight hours of work experience per day is 960 hours if the council wanted to clarify. Okay. Um, Ms. Epps Robbins, do you second that? I second that. Oh, Ms. Miyasaki, you had a question. Um, could we perhaps, um, if my math is correct, I think, um, Sarah, you said it was 960 hours. Mm -hmm. So normally um, RDAs don't always do um, direct patient care for all that 100% of that time. So could I propose possibly like saying like half that amount and say 500 hours of direct patient care versus the 960. Instead of days, say the actual hours. Oh, so we could use 500 hours to be more specific um, with direct patient care. I would even propose a little bit less because not a lot of people work eight hours, five days a week. Um, most assistants, DAs are working three or four days. So uh, maybe we can drop that down to, I would, um, 320. Are there any other public comments? Or excuse me, council member comments? Miss Music. Is that negotiable? Can we do something like 400 hours? Do I hear yeah. going once, going twice? Do I hear 400 hours? <laughs> I know we all need to just... Agreed. 
So 400 sold. All right, so um, once again, we're going to go back and revisit that um, amendment. It's 400 hours working with patients, work experience uh, as a DA before taking the Corona polishing course. 400 hours working with patients. Clinical. Yeah, 400 hours clinical work experience. That's probably a better way of putting it. And Ms. Epps Robbins, do you second? I do second that. Back to public. <laughs> and back to the public. Is there any public comments on that uh, agenda item? Or the motion, excuse me. Hmm. Well, I think we're ready to call a vote then. <laughs> Okay, so do I need to restate the motion? God help me. Uh, the motion is to look at my notes. To recommend to the board. Okay. The the motion is to recommend to the board to oppose AB 2276, unless uh, amended. And the amendments are to remove the Pitt and Fisher component, to require certification and renewal of the Corona polishing, the BLS, life support, the infection control, and or disciplinary action required of the supervising dentist and DA uh, to require direct supervision level with the DDS and to require a 400 hour clinical work experience working as a DA before taking the Corona polishing course. I'm sorry, Chair Fowler, I have two questions on that motion. It was, I had written down that it was permitting for the checks and balances, not necessarily certification. So permitting with the, those same renewal requirements. It would have to be permitting if you're going to be. Mm -hmm. And then 400 hours of direct patient care, not just general work experience. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Can we um, go ahead and add uh, permitting with a, a fee payable to the board? The fee is a big deal. We really need, need yes. to make sure that's part of it. All right. Uh, do I need to restate the whole? No, I, I don't think you need to restate the whole thing. Um, uh, but quickly, uh, it's uh, remove pit and fissure, sealant, require a permit um, to perform coronal polishing as a dental assistant with um, payment of a fee to the board and renewal requirements, including specified courses, uh, direct supervision by a dentist, and uh, 400 hours of direct patient care. Yes. All right, can I now ask uh, board staff to call roll um, and votes for this agenda item? Hello, this is Marella Turan. Should I repeat the motion? I think we've repeated it enough. <laughs> Thank you, Marla. Epps Robbins. Opposed with amendment. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, repeat that for me. So we're taking a vote on whether or not you accept or reject uh, the motion on the floor right now, which is to oppose unless amended. So um, it would be, 
Yes, no, or abstain at this point? Yes. Fowler? Aye. Miyasaki? Yes. Olagi? Olagi, abstain. Pacheco? Pacheco, aye. Pliss? Pliss, yes. Reed Espinosa. Reed Espinosa, aye. The motion passed. Thank you very much. Um, well, this concludes the May 12th Dental Assistant Council meeting. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.